Well, it's good to be back studying with, from the book of John in our efforts to see what John was doing to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. It is important uh, to recognize that one of the essential things to teach in, in view of the message we just heard and gets more so even in our day is to prove that Christ is the Son of God. There are multitudes of people out there that worship something, but we must be able to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God as we are required to prove the very existence of God, that the Bible itself is the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, and the complete revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So keeping with the, Stephen's idea and uh, going on into what we've been studying, uh, we want to keep that in mind about what John's doing. And God is infinite wisdom and love for us, making us intelligent people who have powers of rationality. Does not just tell us, well, except that I'm here, but I won't give you any proof. It was rather ridiculous to think he would make us intellectual and rational, logical thinking people, and yet not expect us to use it. So it's obvious when Paul says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, First Thessalonians 5.21, that he is talking about what I just said and the things that Steve said in his uh, comments. Now, with those things in mind, we finish out the last several verses of John chapter 11, and then we'll be going on into, Lord willing, chapter 12. Um, when you see Christ, as John presents him, raising Lazarus from the dead, you will see that there were certain priests there, certain Pharisees, rather, and they go and tell, uh, some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what had transpired in the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And then the chapter, uh, or rather the paragraph ends, and a new paragraph begins, and that starts in verse 47. So after they do this, the chief priest and the Pharisees convene a council. And basically, as we've urged you to read word for word, that's what you need to do so we can hit the high points. And again, my approach to this is to single out the facts, underscore that word facts, to single out the facts that John gives us. They In this council, inspiration gives us an insight into it. And they say, well, what are you doing? Uh, in fact, they would say, what are we doing? Uh, he's notice they admit something here. This man is performing many signs, not a few signs, but many signs. Now, remember, a sign is not a sign of itself. A sign always points to something else. That's the reason the miracles of Christ were signs that pointed to his deity. So unless we do something, they say in this council, then all men will believe in him. And of course, they had said earlier, and I referred to this in our, I think last week, maybe the week before, uh, they had said, we're not in bondage to anybody. Yet look what they do in the council. Uh, everybody will believe on him. And what are the Romans going to do to us? Well, they're going to come and take away both our place and our nation. Now, do you see the inconsistency and hypocrisy and lack of honesty in these people? Wasn't long ago in talking to Jesus and their debates with him, they say, we're not in body to anybody. Then here, just a little later, they declare that if all of Israel were to believe in him, then the Romans would come and take away their place and their nation. That is also interesting because these are the folks that had had Deuteronomy in their hands for 1,500 years. And in Deuteronomy, God makes it clear as he did elsewhere 
you from the heart, obey me completely, and you will always be blessed by me. But if you choose not to, and to go contrary to the law of Moses, and I'll remove you. So does this tell us even further about the attitude of these people? If they were what God wanted them to be according to the law of Moses, then nobody's going to move them off that land. But they don't even think that way. This is the kind of thinking that was done before the Medes and or rather the Assyrians came in and took uh, the 10 northern tribes is the kind of thinking that was going on in the mind of the Jews, at least the ruling Jews, before Nebuchadnezzar took them away. And so you see this thing keeps reoccurring. Now, there's a point to be made here. It's very easy for a person to trust in uncertain powers of this world to deliver you. That's what they were doing. They did it back in the days of the Assyrians. They did it in the days of the Babylonians. And they're doing it right here. We want to keep our place and we want to keep our nation. But Rome controls us. And people at that time had never seen an empire such as the Roman Empire. They could not conceive of them being able to function and exist, except that they bow the knee to Rome, even though they declared that they didn't. It is important to emphasize before we leave this point that the council, the Sanhedrin, believed the testimony of the Jews who had seen the miracle that was done when Lazarus was raised from the dead. Now, Caiaphas is the high priest, and he makes this comment. You know nothing at all. Well, that's an interesting way to get people's attention. You're a bunch of ignoramuses, is what he said. You do not take into account, and notice the devious mind of this man, just how wicked he is. You don't take into account that it's expedient. Now, an expedient is is an advantage, that it's advantageous for, for you, that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. Now, he did not have in mind Jesus dying for the sins of the world, that he was whom he claimed to be. He had in mind of getting rid of the troublemaker who he thought was going to cause the Romans to come if everybody runs after him, as they said, some said he, they would, and that they would, of course, destroy the nation of Israel. Now, what's very interesting is that this is roughly around AD 30, according to which calendar some people say AD 33, but it's not going to be but 40 years before the Romans do come and lay Judea and Jerusalem and with it the temple to waste. And it wouldn't be because of anything that Jesus did or that Christians did. It would be because of the rebellious Jews who were in open rebellion that caused Rome to send their legions down there to put a stop to the whole thing. So the very thing here that Caiaphas says we don't want to have happen, it's going to happen to them. Now, what is said about this in the scriptures, that is Caiaphas's comment, is that he actually didn't speak these things on his own. Rather, being high priest, he prophesied, and that's interesting that's mentioned here, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. But it was completely different, as I've spent some time on, showing from what we think about when we say Jesus died for us. Because his mind is on a physical nation and them remaining where they had been and were at the time he said this. Of course, the children of God would be scattered abroad. That started after the persecution that arose after the death of Stephen. Now, that's sometime later. People at this point in John's record 
don't know anything about that. Even the apostles, the disciples don't understand all about the church, its nature, but that's going to happen. So from that day forth, they plan to kill Jesus. Now, the scripture tells us that the Lord no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews. He went to the country near the wilderness. Now, I'll say again, as I think I said maybe this past Sunday at some point, that when you read desert in the Bible, it may not mean the way we use the word desert. It may literally mean a deserted place. Deserted to people could be a beautiful place but there are no people there. But when he uses the word wilderness, such as the wilderness of Judea, that's like our, if you want to put it this way, that's the Sahara Desert or our Southwest Desert. So we're able to see that he's going to the desert and he's entering into a city that's close by there called Ephraim. And there he stays with his disciples. Now you see, too, that the scripture relates that many of the Jews went up to Jerusalem in connection with the observance of the Passover feast. When they came up, they were hoping to see Jesus. They were actually seeking Jesus. They wondered whether he would come or whether he would not attend the feast. Well, the chief priests were getting ready for all that. Remember, they made plans to kill him. They're following the advice of Caiaphas that we get rid of him, we get rid of our problems. So they gave orders, that is the chief priests, the Pharisees, others gave orders that if anyone knew where Jesus was, then they would should report it. And the point was that they might arrest him or see or seize him. Now, as we look over this before we journey more, I want to remind you again, he's selecting by inspiration evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten son of God. So let's keep that in mind. That's one reason that the book is written as it's written. But in this time, we see that the Lord has proved that he was deity, the only begotten son of God. And this miracle convinced many of the Jews, the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And they even convinced the chief priest, the Pharisees and the council, because the council admitted, for well, this man is performing many signs. Now we know that earlier they had said, well, yes, he does miracles, but he does them by the power of Beelzebub. But Jesus turned that on his ear because he said, uh, yeah, that would have Satan divided with himself. And a house divided can't stand. And, of course, Abraham Lincoln took that and used it. And it's true. But it was first applied to refute their charge that, yes, he's doing miracles, but doing them by the power of Beelzebub. So the house divided originally had to do with saying, Satan is certainly, his, his people are not divided. They are what they are. And thus Jesus would say, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you will do, so on. Well, now we move into what we have in our Bibles is chapter 12. And at this time, John points out that the Lord goes again to Bethany. And he's going there to visit with Lazarus, Mary and Martha. And when we come to the scene with him there in the house, we see that Martha was serving. She's doing the things that most women have always done. And that is, they're, I like to say she's getting dinner ready. She's doing whatever. And we find that Lazarus is there. But Mary is wherever Jesus is. We'll just say the living room as we think of it. And she anoints the Lord's feet and wipes them with her hair. 
And Judas Iscariot objected. He brings out that this ointment might have been sold and the money taken and given to the poor. Now, John, by inspiration, gives an explanation here. He says Judas really was not concerned about the poor. Rather, he's really a thief. John says that he carried the money bag. That is, he took out of it what was put into it. It's one reason to, you're called a thief. Now, some people might say, well, you mean the Lord chose a man like this to be one of his apostles? It doesn't mean he was like this when the Lord chose him. But sometime in the process, he became this way. And we don't have all the information to tell us what changed him the way he was, but he evidently did. There was a time when this was pointed out to people who teach that a child of God cannot so sin as to be eternally lost. Those who teach once saved, always saved. And when it's pointed out that Judas, and it will be said in the book of Acts, by transgression fell, by transgression fell, and we cite this kind of thing to show that that's the case. And they would argue and say, well, he, he, really, ne he really never was what he should have been in the first place. If you fell, you had to be up there to fall. And so it is that this can't be used to try to say Jesus knew he was a wicked devil when he chose him. No, the totality of the scripture says that this man fell. So people aren't going to be lost because they love the truth and obey it. Nobody can be lost if they do that. You can't take them away from God. But if they choose for whatever reason, to leave the truth, then they fall just like Judas did. And I might mention here that if the apostle Peter, when he denied Christ, if he had not repented, he would have fallen completely and been unredeemable too, as far as his own disposition of heart was concerned. But that wasn't the case with him. That tells you even more about Judas. Judas could have repented, but he didn't. Peter made such a terrible uh, sin, but he repented. The Lord looked at him that last time, and he went out and wept bitterly. And he's back with them when the Lord comes ag again after his resurrection and appears to the apostles. Well, leaving that side note that rises out of this, we see that when Judas had said what he said about the ointment, that the Lord said, let her alone. She has used this in connection with my death. Then he made a statement that sometimes we don't realize, worth thinking about a minute. He said, the poor you have with you always, but you don't always have me. Well, that's interesting. What do you mean? I thought he said in uh, Matthew's account of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, lo, I'm with you always, even in the end of the world. Well, how can he say that you don't always have me with you? He even will say later when he's talking to them about the coming of the Comforter, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit be with them, that uh, he would through him be with them. Well, the point is this. They have him there with them in the flesh as a human being. They were speaking with him at that time. They could see him. They could hear him. They could touch him. He was simply a human being. What he is saying is, I'm not going to be in this position with you. I'm going to leave. And we'll see more about that in later chapters. But it goes to show you in studying the scriptures how some people will try to say the scriptures contradict themselves. One place it says, I'll be with you always. Another place it says, you won't have me. Well, you have to look at what's going on. He's going to die, be buried, rise from the dead, and return to heaven. And of course, as Peter declared with the rest of the apostles in Acts 2, he was sitting, ruling at the right hand of God. 
but they would not have him with them in a bodily, fleshly body fashion. Well, we see that the great multitude of Jews learned that he was in Bethany. So this great multitude went there. But notice they didn't just go to see Jesus. They also went to see Lazarus because Jesus had raised him from the dead. That shows you the curiosity, shall we say, of people. It tells us that sometimes people focus on the wrong thing. Well, it's wonderful to know that Lazarus was raised from the dead. It's wonderful to see him. Jesus himself had said, this is being done to strengthen your faith, done for your benefit. And yet, sometimes we concentrate on the act done rather than on the one who did the act. And salvation wasn't in Lazarus, although his being raised from the dead by Jesus pointed directly at Jesus, who had the power to raise him from the dead and did. Now, what's interesting, these are the, the chief priests who had knew very well what the council had decided. Well, notice they're not only wanting to get rid of the one who raised Lazarus from the dead, but they want to get rid of the proof. They want to take Lazarus' life. And they determined to put Lazarus to death also. And that's because of so many of the Jews were coming to believe on the Lord because of his raising Lazarus from the dead. This tells you that wicked people will go as far as they think they need to go in protecting themselves and their interest. It's ridiculous for some of us to think that, well, nobody would do that. Nobody would say that. Nobody would act that way. Well, what is John telling us here? What's in the New Testament telling us about people? If you're going to preach the gospel to every creature, if you're going to teach the truth that sets men free from sin, the truth that can save you if you're faithful to it in heaven for eternity, there are those people who don't want to hear that truth. There are those people who don't want to be shown that they are in sin and wrong. It's their fault. They have nobody to blame but themselves. It is it, Men are prone to say, well, I did it or I didn't do it, as the case may be, but it's not my fault. Or if I did it or I didn't do it, as the case may be, what's so big about that? And the big thing you hear over the last many years is, don't judge me. Well, let's take note of the fact God's judged already. I liked what the late Marshall Keeble said one time when he was said he was accused of judging somebody. He said, no, no, the Lord said, by the fruits you shall know them. I'm just a fruit inspector. You know, there's a lot of truth to that. Great deal of truth in stating it that way. I'm just a fruit inspector. But I have to have a standard by which to judge those fruit. And that standard is God's infallible word. And I must study. I must write and divide it. I must ascertain his authority. And I must examine beginning, number one, with myself, honestly and objectively, to see where I stand with God and make whatever necessary adjustments need to be made. But then I need to teach the truth to others. Think of what we've seen about Jesus. Jesus is the great physician. He's here to save men, to do what's necessary to save them, to give his life a ransom for many. Yet he upbraided the wicked. Well, did he hate them? No. He wanted them to repent of their sins and obey him. So we would say to everybody today, if you believe Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, why do you call him Lord, Lord? and do not the things which he says. Well, then we see that after they determined, that is, this 
chief priest determined to put Lazarus to death. Get rid of that evidence. The Lord now goes on up to Jerusalem. And a great multitude of people had heard that the Lord was coming to the feast. So as he comes in, they take palm branches and they go out to meet him. They begin to cry out, Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They called him the king of Israel. And the Lord into the city. And by the way, he didn't stop them from doing what they did either. He rode in on a young donkey. Now, many who had seen him called Lazarus from the tomb. Now, notice this. They were bearing him witness. They were saying, this is the man that did that. Remember, there were several Jews around at the time Jesus actually did that. He had been dead four days, remember, in the tomb four days. So the people all knew the man was dead. But then they see him alive, and many saw him raised from the dead by Jesus. The Pharisees, when they see this, it sounds like where we left them earlier, said, look, the whole world has gone after him. Now, there's no way for us to realize how really frightened, chilled to the bones these men were because all they had for them was this life and what they had at the position that they held. And he was scaring them out of their wits. All they could think of is get a hold of that man and get rid of him. Now, at this point, John said there were certain Greeks who wanted to see the Lord. They were among those that were going up to Jerusalem for the feast. I think it's important to realize that in the King James, he talks about Greeks while referring to Jews, that he's referring to Jews raised outside of Judea and Jerusalem in that area. They would have been like Saul of Tarsus or other Jews from various places. And you can see how many of them had gathered there for that. If you go back and look at the list describing those gathered on the day of Pentecost, and they were from everywhere. These were Jews of the diaspora, as it said in Greek, the dispersion. They had been dispersed back at the time of the Assyrians. They had been dispersed at the time of uh, the Babylonian captivity. When you read um, Nehemiah and uh, Ezra, you're reading the account of just a remnant that came back from Persia to rebuild Jerusalem and the walls and the temple. So Jews are all over the place. Uh, you'll remember that uh, Barnabas was from Cyprus. So these want to see Jesus. Now, it's interesting, too, that they went to Philip. Now, does that say something? Philip is a Greek name. So they go to Philip, and then there's been many a sermons uh, titled, Sir, We Would See Jesus. But notice that Philip goes to Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip go together to tell Jesus. You look at that and think about it for a minute. You know, they, they were very respectful. They, were, they revered him. They adored him. They acted with great sobriety around him. They themselves didn't know a lot yet, but they certainly recognized what a lot of people didn't recognize. But now notice this is just the occasion to introduce the other part of this. So when Andrew and Philip go to Jesus, Jesus said this, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now think for a moment what's going to happen to Jesus. 
he's going to spend that agonizing time uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then he's going to go through all night long of a kangaroo court. Nothing in any way whatsoever is fairly done with him. He's going to be sent before Herod and he's going to be sent with Pilate and the whole crowd and he's going to be treated terribly. Undergo a terrible scourging slapped in the face, all that. And then he has to undergo crucifixion the next day. It's no wonder that in carrying his cross, he fell beneath the load of it. And another had to be selected out of the crowd to bear the cross. But now Jesus says, all of that is glorifying me. Well, I guess people have a strange view of glorification, but that's what Jesus said would glorify him. Why would that glorify him? Because it is the only way that man could be saved from sin. It's the only way. It's God's way. And again, read Isaiah 53. Jesus had said in the garden, if it be possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so, being a human being, who would want to undergo all that? He didn't. But he was willing to submit his will to the Father's will because it meant the salvation would be offered to all men and the way of salvation would be accomplished. Then he goes further, and that's grain of wheat falls from the earth and dies. It remains itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Of course, they had no concept of Messiah being this type of person. As we go further, he who loves his life, he declares, loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. I want to mention this about hate in the King James Version when we're taught to hate our mother and father. It doesn't mean hate like we use it today. It means to love them less and, the, and to love God more. Well, we understand that. God should, the first commandment is to love God with all that we have and are. Second, like unto it, love our neighbors ourselves. But people have a false concept of love too, don't they? They either turn love into a lust or into a sick, sentimental, syrupy emotionalism. They don't realize that Jesus manifested the prime perfect to which there's no greater love and that he laid down his life and put himself through that ordeal, that agony, that shame. Thereby he was glorified. So he's saying to us what he said earlier, that we are to take up our cross, whatever burden we bear, whatever sacrifices we must make to render obedience faithfully to him, and we follow after him. When we're trying to teach people the truth, we shouldn't be too long teaching them that to live faithful to the Lord as a Christian, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, members of his church, the blood-bought body, shed his blood to purchase the church, Acts 20, verse 28, that it is not necessarily going to be a bed of roses, uh, an easy cushion to sit on. The Lord, and so does all of the New Testament, teaches plainly that that's not the way it is in denying oneself and always doing what the Lord wants you to and the way he wants you to do it. And for the reason, or if there's more than one reason that he wants you to do it, there could be great privation and much sacrifice, which means giving up what's very important and needful to you. How far can we go in that situation? Well, remember Revelation chapter two, verse 10, be thou faithful unto 
death and you'll receive a crown of life. Well, again, as has been pointed out, it did not say until death. He said unto death. What does unto mean? Well, if you look at Acts 2.38 in the American Standard Version and other versions, it'll say repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ unto the remission of sins. Baptized unto the remission of sins. What do you mean? Unto means in order to a given end. Why are you as believers commanded to repent and be baptized? In order to a specific given end. And what is it? Remission of sins. Now take that and come over to our passage, Revelation 2.10. Be thou faithful unto death. In order to death. If your faith requires you to die, then die. That's what's being said. Now that could be a young man of 20, could be an older person of 40, could be anybody, anywhere. But you're dying rather than ceasing to be faithful. Because America has had such great blessings, constitutional, constitutional protection for freedom of religion, we have a hard time understanding really what it was for people to truly be convicted of the truth of the gospel and really converted to Christ in the first century. There were many of those people that were under penalty of death. And you know the Jews, how they felt about it, because many of the priests believed on him but would not confess him for fear of being put out of the synagogue. So I've got to love God and his gospel system more than I love my life also because my life doesn't end when my body dies my life goes on and if I would escape the second death the lake which burns with fire and brimstone then I will continue to be faithful even if it crossed me my life and my body I'll continue to be faithful so if anyone serves me, then he's going to be following me. What does it mean to follow Christ? Adhere to his teachings. That's what it is to be a disciple of Christ. He says, where I am, there shall my servant be also. And then he says something that shows forth the humanity of Jesus. He says, my soul is troubled. And yet now he gives us something we know already, but it emphasizes how heavily that was upon his mind because he says, for this purpose, I came to this hour. He said at another time, to this end was I born. Christ knew that this is the way his life was going to end, that he would have to undergo this terrible, painful, shameful ordeal. Nothing that he deserved. He was sinless. And his own people who had had the law of Moses for 1,500 long years, whereby they should have recognized him, would be the ones to put him to death. And thus they would even cry out before Pilate, his blood be upon us and upon our children. Now what's interesting is that he says, Father, Glorify thy name. We don't usually think about this case, uh, the voice that come from came from heaven, but this time the voice comes out of heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. We are members, if we're Christians, of the spiritual body of Christ, our Lord being the only head, and the head directs the body. And we are members in particular. We are to glorify God through Jesus Christ. I know of no way to do that, but to adhere faithfully to whatever he teaches us and to be consistent in our everyday living and doing what he requires of us. Now look what Jesus said. 
Jesus says, this voice is not come for my sake, but for your sakes. When we start back with the Lazarus matter, when he got there and raised him from the dead, all the way to here, notice he says, all of these things are being done for your sake. Well, really think about it. Every account we've got in the Bible from the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation is for your sake and my sake. Every word of the Bible is because God loves us and wants us to be in heaven with him. Over the years of examining scriptures, you're trying to understand some things better and maybe understand some things, just understand them. And you know the word of God was put here so you could understand his will. So you know when you come across a passage that may seem to be hard to understand, that just means you keep digging because that must mean what the Lord wanted us to do. But every word of the Bible is to lead us to heaven. And thus we understand that all of this is done for our sake. All of it. And that carries us back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I wish I could understand that agape love, the willing to do good to all men, even when they hate you. I know I understand it to a degree, but why would God do what he did to save you and me, to save humans. What is there about a human that God wants to save? Does that, does that tell us why when we follow after the teachings of the Bible as it truly is, God's word, living on this earth for it, does that tell us why men's value of human life rises when they look at man through the eyes of God as the scriptures reveal him. I know of no way to elevate man to really appreciate and value life, human life, other than a proper knowledge of God's word, especially in looking at what he did to save us when we could never do it ourselves. Then Jesus further says, now judgment is upon the world. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. I be lifted up from the earth. I will draw all men to myself. Well, there's a mouthful there, to say the least. Or even to say the most. You need to think about that a while. The judgment is upon this world. The sentencing is here. It's important for us to realize when he says that the ruler of this world shall be cast out. Who's the ruler of this world? Who has God given power to that hates us and hates him? Well, it's Satan. But he, he's bound, if you please. He's limited in power. He can't do to us what he did to Job. Why? Because God has said he couldn't. And that's, this is where we go back again and read the beginning of Job. Satan comes. There's a gathering of the sons of God. And Satan comes in there too. And God draws his attention to Job. Points out to them that Job is a perfect and upright man. Loves the truth and hates evil. The devil immediately begins to accuse him. He says, does Job serve you for naught, for nothing? Why, you pay him to serve you. Well, then he tells them, you can have at all he's got, and he was a very rich man, but you can't touch his body. So he limited him there with Job. 
He comes again later on and allows him to touch his body. But he can't take his life. So he limits him. Well, when it comes to being a faithful member of the church of our Lord, a Christian, brother and sisters in Christ, God's family, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, as we're faithful to him, because we are faithful, we may be persecuted. We may have our physical bodies actually hurt. We can be put in jail. We can be burned at the stake. We can be killed. But Satan has no power to force us against our will to obey him. And so it is that we're taught clearly that if we're faithful, what did we say earlier? Unto death in order to death. If that's what's required of me to be faithful, then I'll die to stay faithful. Satan has no power at all over us. And there's where our focus ought to be. And we look to Jesus. Remember the Greeks came and said we would see Jesus. Well, it's interesting that here he says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. When we preach the gospel message, we lift up Jesus. And we lift him up because he allowed himself to be lifted up on that cross. And you'll remember that when the snakes came among the children of Israel because of their murmuring, bit many, they were fiery serpents, many died. They cried out to Moses for deliverance. God directed him to make that brazen serpent, put it on a pole. Anybody looked on it, be cured. Well, that was all typology. That was a shadow of the Lord who would be lifted up. And thus on that cross, by his own will, he died on the cross after suffering greatly. And thus he shed his blood for the remission of sins and offered his body and sacrifice for our sins. And thus rising from the dead the third day, death was not able to hold him. And through our faith in him as the perfect sinless shepherd, and in this case, the lamb, then we have our hope and our salvation, and we cannot be moved. Now the multitude said, we've heard out of the law that Christ has remained forever. How then can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? He said, who is the Son of Man? Or they said, who is the Son of Man? Now, really, this is a bit ridiculous at this point for those people to still be. What is this saying about them? They got hearts that are, I don't know what to compare it to, harder than diamond. Jesus said, for a little while longer, the light's among you. Walk while you have the light. And while you have the light, believe the light. And then Jesus departs. And he hides himself from the people. And though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they did not believe on him. And God, through Isaiah the prophet, talked about their blindness and their hardness of heart. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory, and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval or the praise of men rather than the approval or praise of God. Well, we're winding up another night of the study of John. Hope it's been profitable. Would you bow with me, please, for a word of prayer as we close the lesson? Our Father in heaven, we humbly come to thy throne of grace and mercy, hallowing thy name and thankful for the day, the time we have had together to spiritually revive ourselves amidst this busy week, cause ourselves to think even more so on our long home and of our obligation to be faithful to be here, receive strength for such study, with fellow Christians, that we might walk the straight and narrow way. God, direct us to be with the sick, the orphans and widows, and the afflicted throughout the world, especially these of the household of faith, and strengthen us 
every day by the truth to live for thee. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.